Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you above all to Ulan Lian, who has uh, arranged together with Marie Jose and the staff here this great uh, symposium, where I have actually learned so many new things about Gustav and his art. Anyhow, uh, I will give you a much uh, more um, accessible, uh, plain, straightforward uh, description or uh, discourse about Gustav's earliest years and his uh, path into from uh, from art being an artist and activist to becoming an activist artist anyhow let's see if this works it does okay act or perish from art and activist to activist art this is the gustav that you by now we should be pretty familiar with from his 1962 uh, uh, acid, uh, sorry, acid uh, painting demonstration at, at uh, South Bank Center. Gustav is famous for a number of things. Auto-destructive art, auto-creative art, machine art, dealing with computer art, and being also a pioneer in uh, environmental art and political art. Much of this activity was based on his frequent manifestos and other texts related to these manifestos. Uh, he made, between 1959 and 1962, five different uh, manifestos relating to auto-destructive art and auto-creative art. And that's basically what I'm going to talk about if I manage to do it in time. And please interrupt me if I speak too long. Um, and I will also use uh, Gustav's own words mostly because I think sometimes that is also the most clear expressions of his ideas. I'm also going to stress his background in German culture as well as in Jewish culture. He was born into politics of the worst sort. Uh, and he became simultaneously an artist and an activist. And finally, an activist artist. So, let's see. This is Nuremberg, where Gustav was born in 1926. Uh, a medieval town, hometown of Albrecht Dürer, and also the legendary uh, medieval poet Hans Sachs. Uh, this is also the place where the Wagner's Meistersinger, der Nuremberg, uh, is taking place. It was a big city of its time, 400,000 people. It had also a large synagogue and a very big uh, Jewish community of 10,000 people, the second largest in Bavaria. So, let's see. It also had Julius Streicher, maybe the most active and aggressive of Nazi activists in the 1920s. Julius Streicher was the publisher of the magazine uh, Der Stürmer, which was an extremely violent uh, and aggressive rhetorically uh, in regards, not, not the least in regards of, of, of its anti-Semitic language. It called for the extinction of Jews already in 1933. Nuremberg is also famous uh, as a scene for the earliest uh, Nazi activists, activists already in the 1920s, and uh, their persecution of the Jewish minority. Uh, the vehemence of this persecution uh, actually caused the Jewish community to organize it better, f uh, creating a false sense of security, which made that actually very few members of the community left Nuremberg before 1938. The medieval history was also at attractive uh, for Nazis with its reference to, to old German Gothic culture. Uh, it became a symbolic capital of the Nazi movement. In, from 1923 and on, uh, the party conferences were staged here, developing in those famous Reich, Reichsparteitage, the Nazi rallies, uh, famous not the least from Leni Riefenstahl's film, Triumph der Willens from 1935. 
these were, were sorry, uh, staged mass uh, displays of light uh, and, and, and people, flags and uniforms. You could say, referring to the title of this conference, that, that, that you had ethics pulled out of aesthetics, for certainly there was a lot of aesthetics in play. Uh, Nuremberg is also famous for the Nuremberg laws, the race laws of 1935. Uh, so this is where, uh, where Gustav was born, to Fanny and, and uh, Judah Metzger. Uh, from the age of three he was educated in he Hebrew and Biblical studies. And as he, he said in an interview with, with Hans Ulrich Obrist, you can't have a greater introduction to intellect and history. And that's what I had from the age of three. And I was fully prepared to take it in, and I was happy to learn whatever I could, could as a young, budding Jew. And in an interview I made with him in 2005, he said, One of the earliest memories from my childhood in Nuremberg, we were living in a house in Fürthstrasse, which is a big, linear road from Nuremberg to Fürth. One day I went into the yard and onto the street and joined a, a marching group of political people. I think they were more left-wing than right-wing. Uh, this was before 33. It was, I believe, my first appearance in politics. Sorry, that was actually from Aubrey's interview. That uncertainty of color, whether it was a brown or a red uh, demonstration, is significant. Because Gustav was actually quite impressed as, as a young boy uh, by the glam, the glitter, and the uniforms of these mass parades. And this is uh, from my interview with him. He said, all these marches came past, and they took maybe a whole day to pass. Well, this is all to do with art. This is all to do with design. And there is no question that one of the reasons that I became an artist was that in Nuremberg, I had this powerful, extraordinarily powerful presentation of art, of visual art, of design, of architecture, of light experiences, of modern light experiences. What a background for becoming an artist. I had an almost daily education in arts, and as soon as I could, I would spend hours in the most important museums in Nuremberg. And this went on for, for years, all the years of my youth. And so again, I had the best possible education in art, without even knowing it, without my parents even having actually the slightest serious interest in the Nuremberg old town. As Polish Jews, it was almost forbidden territory. And in reference to the Nazi art, he said, you couldn't just re reject all that because it was Nazi period and it was Nazi art and it had connections with a regime that destroyed my family and destroyed millions of others and destroyed Germany, destroyed a country. This might actually uh, explain to some degree his later academic studies in, in Nazi art and the, uh, and the conferences uh, he arranged on uh, the, 19, the, uh, the art of the, the Third Reich. You could even say that, that uh, when, when uh, Gustav Metzger was, was uh, saved by the children's uh, transports in 1939, it was a, a form of expulsion from a, from a culture which he actually had embraced already. And this was uh, maybe the, well, the first of a, a series of expulsions that Gustav Metzger experienced in his life. Okay, that's more Nazi art. And that's Arno Brecker, and maybe the most famous of the sculptors. In 1939, uh, Metzger arrived to London with the children's res rescue transport, together with his brother Mendel. Uh, his parents and an older brother disappeared in the Holocaust, while two sisters actually were rescued to, or rescued themselves uh, to Israel. Uh, soon Metzger was ev evacuated from London to, to the countryside and later to the Leeds, where he trained as a carpenter. Okay. This is a sensational image of Gustav, because he actually has hair. <laughs> um, as a young man, primarily uh, uh, during those years in, in uh, Leeds, he was much um, uh, impressed or influenced by Eric Gill, the typographer, the artist, the peace activist, and socialist. 
Uh, this is what he says. He was all about changing man's relation to the cosmos and changing society. This was way before the destructive art. The fun uh, he wanted fundamental change, which I am still concerned with. That's what it's all about. Fundamental change in capitalism, fundamental change to the use of information. In 1944, Gustav uh, joined a socialist uh, commune in Bristol, which he soon left. They were uh, predomin predominantly trots Trotskyists, but there he also got uh, influenced by Wilhelm Reich, uh, um, who tried to, uh, to combine, as you know, socialism with ps psychoanalysis. There was a man who converted me to Wilhelm Reich, as another kind of father figure, and as another kind of Edmund Shekely. Uh, oh, I forgot to mention Shekely, uh, sorry. Um, we, who was a Hungarian, uh, Jewish, uh, also a refugee uh, living in Mexico, who wanted to reform society. Um, he was a pacifist and fruitarian, and probably also very much a, 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 an inspiration to, to Gustav's later vegetarianism. Uh, Okay, there was a man who uh, in, uh, converted me to Wilhelm, Wilhelm Reich as another kind of father figure and as another kind of Edmund Shekely. So there were two men in my life at that point who said, we must change ourselves. The one through sexuality, that's Reich, the other through a, na a nature cure. I would, I would be mo moving in one line to change myself and to change society simultaneously. I decided I could combine the two. I could change the world, continue along, along left-wing re revolutionary ideals, and enter art where I could also go in this direction. And there were times when I would perhaps give up these ideals and couldn't go on fighting towards this ultimate fusion of art and politics and revolutionary change. So, in 1945, uh, Gustav and, and his brother Max uh, Mendel uh, enrolled art classes in Cambridge. They studied sculpture. They were convinced, both of them, that they would be sculptors. Much impressed by uh, artists like Henry Moore, uh, Epstein, and Eric Gill, who Eric Gill, Gill was also a sculptor. Uh, by... Uh, they enrolled with, with the, uh, let's see, uh, they, they, they soon moved to London in, in uh, 1949 and uh, started studying uh, under David Bomberg. At, and uh, this is how Gustav uh, describes him. So I remember walking into the, the life room, and there was a small man who looked sort of unprepossessing, un unprepossessing, sorry, Mesker recalls. It was David Bomberg, but within a few weeks, one realized that this was not an ordinary person. He was a charismatic, had enormous experience, and he was, I think, a great artist. He became yet another uh, father figure to Gustav Metzger. Uh, both brothers be became, for a period, almost family with the Bombergs. Bomberg uh, related uh, to Italian f futurism, in, in particular maybe an artist like uh, Balla. According to Metzger, let's see, uh, this is a work by Gustav. In 1945, David Bomberg's class at the Borough Polytechnic was the only school in England where ideas and forms that had points of contact with the New York School, for instance, were cons consistently developed and practiced. And he, he also uh, says about, in re regards to traditional drawings, emphasizing outlines of the figure and such, uh, Bomberg said, Forget about that. Go for the structure. Go for the center and use the full weight of your body. That was the beginning of my move towards the end, end result, towards dealing with the central salient points of the figure, going to the heart of the matter. That's Bomberg. Bomberg uh, had rejected uh, invites uh, from Wyndham Lewis uh, and his magazine Blast. Uh, possibly because of Louis' uh, well-known anti-Semitism and fascist ideology. 
But like Wyndham Lewis, David Bomberg, and his artist group, Borrow Group, the Borrow Group published manifestos. So this is the third manifesto of that group. And certainly an inspiration also to, for Gustav's later uh, manifesto writing, as were many other uh, manifestos of, of the time. The relationship between Bomberg and Gustav Metzger uh, came to a sudden end in 1953. Uh, Gustav had uh, engaged himself in, in, uh, in, in arranging an exhibition uh, with the Borrow Botteja group, uh, a group of students, including also uh, David Bomberg. But uh, they had different uh, interests, and Gustav criticized uh, Bomberg for his, his uh, uh, eagerness to put himself in, in the center of the exhibition and resign for, for, uh, from. Uh, from uh, from his uh, role as the secretary of the exhibition, or the commissioner, and um, which led to an uh, immediate rejection from uh, Bomberg. This is the letter found uh, some year ago in, in Gustav's uh, archive at the Tate uh, Library, uh, where Bomberg uh, rejects uh, Metzger, and uh, he writes, uh, I have your letter of the 13th of December and re reject all you have put forward regarding more cooperation with me. Thinking I could help you was a mistake. In trying, I have done myself little honor and earned a great deal of damage. Sorry. Uh, my energies are dreaded uh, to, uh, to retrieving the devastation. The pattern of my life will reform according to my own ideas. Your resignation from, from the Borough Botteja is according to your own thinking and needs, and needs no comment from me. Your books are packed and will follow tomorrow. David Bomberg. Uh, Gustav Metzger's comment later was, you rebel against the father, and you rebel against the teacher. And in this light, you could see Bomberg's response to Gustav as a repulsion, the second one in his, in his uh, life in England. So, Kings Lynn and London. Uh, in 1953, Gustav moved to Kings Lynn, remote from London and east coast of England. Uh, prior to that, he actually wanted to move to the countryside. Uh, and a, tra a trip to, the, to Shetland Islands in, the, in 1951 had left a great impression on him. He, he writes, I had lived in London or wanted to get away from there. The Shetland Islands were a, p a peaceful place back then. There were no cars. There were no, uh, they were not allowed, except for a few that had to be, uh, to be brought over by ship. There was a kind of calm there that I had never experienced before. During this time, I wrote down things that were important to me. One of these uh, was that cars had to go. It was quite extreme. They had to go. I thought a lot about destruction uh, caused by cars, the destruction of human environment, of nature. It was an obsession. That was the start of my deliberate, politically consistent opposition to technology. As an artist, uh, the years 1953 to 56 became a hiatus, a pause, probably caused by the, by the shock of, uh, from the break with, with Bomberg and the confusion following. And Gustav made instead his living from selling second-hand objects at a time when uh, nothing, uh, there was nothing fancy about flea markets. In Kings Lynn, he engaged uh, in, in the local environment in preserving uh, the, the old town center, which became, in fact, a success. Uh, he realized that, that uh, through activism, he could actually make a mark so uh, this engagement soon moved into the rising anti-nuclear uh, arms movement. In 1957, he was one of fun, uh, founding members of King's Lynn ca campaign for nuclear disarmament. Uh, in 1958, he joined another organization, uh, direct, uh, my, uh, sorry, direct Action Committee Against Nuclear War in short, the DAC. Uh, together with these, he marched uh, against North Pickenham missile base, uh, and uh, in, the, in the later famous second um, Aldermaster marches from 1958 and on. 
he also became, in 1960, a, fo a founding member of the Committee of 100, where probably the most famous member and, 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 and the chair was uh, Lord Bertrand Russell. Gustav uh, worked as a sort of informal secretary, and in his archive there is uh, quite a rich material of machine-written um, invitations and manuscripts. One of them is called Manifesto, and I'm personally convinced that this manifesto is uh, written by Gustav himself. Sorry, this is actually the wrong image. This is the Act of Perish uh, uh, pamphlet where Gustav very likely was the one who invented the uh, headline. In fact, he provided the design for this uh, booklet. But in, in the manuscript, which, which seems to never have been uh, published, uh, and it's an undated machine-typed document on a torn typewriting paper. Uh, it is written, and probably by uh, Gustav himself. It is not impossible for an elected government to enact wicked laws, even so wicked as the anti-Semitic laws of the Nazis. Suppose yourself to be living under such a government. Suppose you found yourself by chance in position to release a wagon load of victims on their way to some English Auschwitz some sunny afternoon in a country railway station, the sentry drowsing, say. Would you think it right to ref refrain from individual act and wait for the next election? Once Auschwitz was in operation, the time for res resistance was passed because the penalty for resistance then was to go into Auschwitz yourself, your wife and children too. No one can hold the German people guilty for their failure to resist under those circumstances, for only saints and heroes could have undertaken it. And that, that is our case now. It will be too late to protest when the bom bombs are falling, and the evil uh, our society has accepted is no longer incipient, but actual. If we fail to resist effectively now, while well we can, we shall be responsible, and for an evil compared with which the suffering endured in Auschwitz will seem trivial. In 1961, uh, Gustav uh, took part in a peaceful demonstration outside the Minister of Defense. It was, um, uh, the police interfered and the participants were brought to court. Russell, uh, then aged 87 I think, was sentenced to seven days, while Metzger spent one month at Drake Hall Open Prison in Staffordshire. Uh, at the occasion of this, uh, of, 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 of the uh, course, uh, oh, sorry, of, of the uh, court nego negotiations, Gustav uh, uh, said, and this is reprinted in Peace News in September 61. I came to this country from Germany when 12 years old, my parents being Polish Jews, and I am grateful to the government for bringing me over. My parents disappeared in 1943, and I would have shared their fate. But the situation is now far more bar barbarous than Buchenwald, for there can be absolute uh, obliteration at any moment. I have no other choice than to assert my right to live, and we have chosen in this committee a method of fighting which is the exact opposite of war, the principle of total no non-violence. So this is how Gustav developed in those years, and you can see how, how, how strongly, uh, how his, his, his movement to a form of manifestos is, is constant, but uh, uh, uniquely directed into the, into the activities of, of, of his um, uh, peace and anti-nuclear uh, missile activities. In... Uh, 1956, he was, his uh, art uh, was also radically changed after the impressions from an exhibition called uh, This is Tomorrow at the Whitechapel Gallery. Um, a, a today, a legendary show, as you know. And um, this uh, exhibition uh, included collectives of artists, architects, and others who together created installations then possibly called environments, 
uh, which obviously Gustav was extremely impressed by. He actually brought all the posters, the rather famous, I think there were six or seven of them, uh, back to, to King's Lynn and, and pasted them on, his, uh, on the windows of his second-hand shop, which also at that time functioned as a gallery. And as you can see, some of the visual forms these, these installations took might very well have inspired him to, to, to uh, his autodestructive uh, actions. At the after this exhibition, in the following years, he actually realized much of the form that he has mentioned uh, in previous quotes, uh, where he uh, approached, for instance, Ashen painting and, and that sort of abstract expressionism, as in these uh, drawings found in his archive. He also started to work uh, more violently on, on, on new sorts of service, surfaces, cardboard, but also on, on mild steel, as is one of maybe, is it six different uh, uh, pa existing paintings, where he uh, used. Um, uh, a tool to make marks on, 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 the, on the surface and also work with chalk and other unconventional materials on, the, on steel. But as you can see, he's moving uh, on in his uh, artwork and maybe the most radical work is this, where he has uh, worked on the surface of a plastic sheet with a, a knife or some other tool. Sorry, Art into Action, manifests, uh, Manifestos and Lecture Demonstrations, 1959 to 62. How much time do I have? Very little. Very little, okay. So, uh, I will be short. Um, so, this is uh, Gustav uh, in 1959 uh, at the occasion of his exhibition. Uh, at the gallery in Monmouth Street in London. Uh, the text uh, published at the occasion of the exhibition says, the discarded cardboards which is on view was probably part of a television package. These cardboards are, are nature unadulterated by commercial considerations or, or the demands of the contemporary drawing room. They have reference to the greatest qualities in modern painting, sculpture and architecture. These cardboards were made automatically for strict purpose, for a strict purpose and for temporary usage. I must stress that Gustav's expressions are always unironic. He actually means what he says. So when he compares this with classical art, he should be taken seriously. Just as when he suggested uh, uh, the years without art, there was no irony uh, behind these proposals. Neither is there any irony when he speaks about these cardboards as admir admirable. Uh, uh, examples of, of, of uh, uh, classic forms. Uh, in many ways, of course, this is uh, much uh, like a ready-made in, in a Duchamp sense, but taken a step further. And he would take uh, his actions further steps in the, in the following, uh, in, the, in this very year. In, with, together with the same document, he uh, published his first autodestructive art manifest. Uh, where he writes, uh, autodestructive art is primarily a form of public art for in industrial societies. Autodestructive painting, sculpture, and, uh, and construction is a total unit of idea, sight, form, color, method, and timing of the, of the disintegration process. And I would also stress uh, a few more sentences in the manifesto. Uh, this is the print version. Uh, okay. Autodestructive art can be created with natural forces, traditional techniques, and technological techniques. Autodestructive art can be machine produced and factory assembled, just like the cardboard boxes, for instance. Uh, but what he envisions here is, is actually an art form which is remote from the hands of the artists, where he even invites. Uh, uh, random processes, which will be uh, increasingly clear in his following manifestos. So in his second manifesto from 1960, he writes, 
And this time, the, the factual language from the first manifesto has changed to a much more poetic uh, language. And you can, uh, uh, and, and it reminds me of, of Gustav's later engagement in, 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 uh, in, in a context where, where concrete poet, poets were also included. He has a lot in, in common with them. He writes, man in Re Regent Street is auto-destructive. Rockets, nuclear weapons are auto-destructive. The drop, drop, dropping of age, age bombs, not interest in ruins, the picturesque. And to, to, to make it shorter, sorry. Uh, I just mentioned uh, a couple of sen sentences. Autodestructive art reenacts the obsession with destruction. Uh, Autodestructive art demonstrates man's power to accelerate disintegrative processes of nature and to order them. Uh, and it mirrors the compulsive perfectionism of arms manufacture, polishing to destruction point. The chaos of capitalism and of Soviet communism, the coexistence of surplus and starvation, the increasing stockpile of nuclear weapons, more than enough to destroy technological societies, the, disint the disintegrative effect of machinery and of life in vast built-up areas, on the person. So uh, the same year, Gustav Metzger started uh, to, to work with or uh, experimenting with, with autodestructive processes. In this case, primarily uh, acid paintings uh, with acid on, on, on a nylon canvas. Uh, the first presentation was a temple gallery on the 22nd of June, 1960. Uh, he has uh, spoken himself of an aesthetic of revulsion. And he says, as can be seen in the photographs of the King's Lynn experiment and the demonstration in London in June 1960, the rips and tears of the nylon are very close to the scraps of paper and odd bits of textile or leather found in bags outside clothing workshops. And you can see one of those bags that he uh, assembled as a uh, form of sculpture with paper and, 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 textile, and textile parts. Um, Paintings with oil on canvas or board involves measures of control and of chance. Uh, so does painting with acid on nylon. But here there is an inbuilt instruction for the material, acid, to go, to go on a kind of rampage, obliterating the material, nylon, in unprecedented and wholly uncontrollable ways. And it, I would like to stress that he actually talks about the material going on a rampage not the artist. It's, it's really because you might get the wrong impression when you see the documentation of Gustav uh, acid painting because it's not, he's not interested in this sort of performative action. He is interested in the process that goes on in the material. Um, it was by working on the first, uh, he also created a model uh, that you see him in action. He was also working on a model for, for a monument, for an uh, autodestructive uh, monument. Uh, and he says, it was by working on the first model that some uh, clarity began to emerge. Sorry, I would also uh, uh, tell that this mo monument is supposed to destroy itself over time. As it is made by metal, it will probably take a while. But uh, anyhow, this is an, uh, a long-term uh, autodestructive process. Uh, he's uh, conceiving. Uh, it was by working on the first model that, I, uh, that some clarity began to, to emerge. That sculpture would begin, like the cardboards, as a statement about ultimate abstract form and the beauty and perhaps also terror inherent in the machine product. And then, imperceptibly, in time, it turns into something that is the opposite of the starting point. Rust appears, soiling the abstraction. Then ragged holes emerge, uh, grow unpredictably at different parts of the structure. The sculpture increasingly takes on the characteristics of chaos and disorder of the, uh, of the found bags. Finally, all that will remain are the piles of fallen metal and collapsed girders, ready for the, uh, for the scrap heap or to be uh, shoveled into rubbish bags.
Then uh, he also comments, Autodestructive art is an ass assault on the dealer's system. It undermines this system in uh, numerous ways. I laid so much emphasis on the public nature of autodestructive art, not only because I believed that uh, that was the correct position, but in order to direct the mo movement away from the dealer system. This opposition between autodestructive art uh, and the dealer system is not only on the emotional, intellectual and artistic plane, but is also rooted in the economics of the situation. This is from his... Uh, uh, Architectural Association uh, publication uh, from 1965. Um, okay. Okay, here. Uh, and here I also want to emphasize his, his great... Uh, interest in these random projects and maybe the most neglected of all, all his works are those rubbish bags which he actually in those early years returns uh, uh, well, uh, frequently to this constant reference to these uh, these bags in the 19 uh, in the in his writings from the 1960s um, he says that in the evening some of the finest works of art produced now are dumped on the streets of soho and in other texts, he writes about the perfect moment to see these uh, bags being assembled on the streets. Now, I'm uh, wondering, is it time for, for me to stop? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I would uh, advise you to read the following manifest of Gustav Metzger and have a look especially on, hi on his uh, emphasis on random processes. On, um, and also how he manages to move between uh, different forms of, uh, forms of discourses, between a very poetic form uh, at, at, at some moments, and sometimes extremely aggressive political language. And he takes these both positions, uh, and possibly many others as well, but, but it, it, it also shows that, that Gustav Metzger was not only a political artist, but certainly an artist above all, and very much, I would say, a poet and a writer. And that's where I finish this talk. Thank you.